<clears throat> Over the years, I've done hundreds of videos about Chinese and Asian art and talked about the auction market and so forth uh, because it's, it's an area of interest that I've had for many, many years. I've been an antique dealer for 40 years. But one of the things that uh, struck me is that we sometimes lose sight of the reason why we began collecting and why we collect. And uh, it's to live with the objects. It's living with things that have historic, uh, historic uh, precedent antecedents, where they began uh, at a time period when certain things were happening, and uh, it makes them interesting. Uh, how they were made, why they were made, when they were made, where they were first produced, uh, where they've been since they were made, and this includes uh, uh, Chinese art, European art, African art, South American art, Central America, America, early American history, and all that. And in order to have a, a place that's like that, that's furnished with these things, you have to have a lot of interest. And um, uh, we often run into this thing that, that is, are we decorating or are you furnishing your home tastefully? That's sort of where it comes to. And if you're only interested in decorating and you're not particularly interested in uh, art and art history and antiques and, and, and beautiful objects, where they came from and uh, how they came to be today, uh, where they are, um, if you're not interested in that, it, this, this, is, this video isn't going to be of interest to you. And if you want to decorate your house, uh, if that's, that's how you feel, uh, just hire a decorator and uh, answer the basic questionnaires you know, about color and fabric options and drapes and room use and all that good stuff. Write a check and wait for the results. Unfortunately, what's going to happen, though, if you're a person who relies on, on a decorator or a designer um, for how your house looks um, without a lot of enormous amount of input from you, what's going to happen is that in five or ten years, you're just going to be doing it all over again and probably at considerable expense uh, because the style or fashion that you adopted through your decorator has become passe. They'll be sure to tell you. Um, every year, it, you'll notice if you look here on YouTube, um, you'll see if, if you look into the designer and decorator, one of the first things you're struck with um, every year is things that are out in 2022 things that are out in 2023, things that I hope go away in 2023. And these are all done by interior decorators and designers trying to gin up um, uh, a, a new direction for them to uh, uh, probably cash in on. And it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of hilarious to watch. Uh, all these things that at one point, they most assuredly a few years ago, were uh, probably encouraging people to do it now are passe. Why? Because that's the business. They're in business to do business. And you can't get people to come and redecorate their houses unless they have a need to feel as though they're, they're fashionable. They're with the most recent trend and so forth. And people that collect art and antiques don't care about much of that. Uh, people that collect uh, true art, true antiques, uh, 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 cultural items, material culture, all that, they're interested in material culture and art. They're interested in the history. Um, and this is this is the, the 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 big dividing line between the two. Um, for, quite frankly, if you're if you're a fairly advanced antique collector or art collector, you have a genuine interest in it. Um, the only time you might want to use a decorator, if you feel like spending some money, is maybe for a little advice on colors of walls, fabric maybe that might go someplace that you're unaware of, that kind of thing. Uh, other than that, you really don't need them. Uh, they, 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 most, most decorators have a very limited knowledge about art. They know almost nothing about antiques in most cases. They used to. I used to know some highly knowledgeable uh, decorators um, that started out as antique dealers and they went into the, into the decorating world and they did some absolutely great houses. And unfortunately today, a lot of people have jumped into the uh, decorating game with no training other than color composition. Um, and, and how to lay out a room and this kind of thing. But, they, but when it comes to objects themselves, there's, it's a very, very shallow pool. And as, as such, if you watch videos about uh, decorators and designers, um, they, they use uh, adjectives all the time, but never tell you what anything is. And they'll say, oh, this is wonderful. This is, this is fun. Um, I don't know how the expression fun came into the decorating jo uh, vocabulary, but it did, and it stuck. And it's, it's sort of a, it's sort of a, a, a filler word um, when they have nothing else to really say about something. And it's too bad. And, and it's, 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 it's sad for the people that end up with this stuff because it's really not their house. It's the vision of somebody else that they're, they're sort of being pushed into in many, many, many cases. Um, you got to keep in mind always also that authentic and historically tasteful things never go out of style. 
um, decorators and designers and people, you know, that ha have a, 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 an interest in making money will tell you that they're out of style because they want you to buy something. But in, in general, when you look at uh, the, the great furniture periods of, of, of mankind, especially in the last three or 400 years, you know, Chippendale, uh, 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 federal period furniture, uh, French furniture, Louis the Fifteenth, all that. It's it 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 has stood the test of time because it was tastefully done, beautifully done, is reflective of a certain period or a high point in culture, and uh, it still works today, and it'll always work because tasteful things, as I said, never go out of stale. Fashions and things change all the time, but. But great things are always, always visually accessible. Uh, I mean, visually successful, and that's 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 the simple fact of it. And what you see today in a lot of houses, I call them soulless houses. Um, they have they have chests of drawers, but the chest of drawer doesn't have any history to it. There's nothing behind it. It's just it's just it's 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 a couple of boards that have been put together, um, sort of in this manner, sort of in that manner. Uh, they painted up some oddball color and. Okay, here you go. This is it. In reality, it's just schlock. It's just schlock. It's like Ikea. Um, uh, everything that Ikea sells uh, is is basically junk. Um, and I, I know people don't like to hear that. I, I've seen uh, interior designers talking about the great things they find at Ikea because they found a piece of amber glass that has a certain shape to it or, or, or some kind of little white table they can put in the corner of a room and it only costs $35. It's all junk. It's just junk. Uh, there's no other way to say it. Um, and un unfortunately, uh, uh, the other side of it is that money and taste usually and very often have nothing to do with one another unless the person with some money has a personal interest in art and antiques and living with beautiful objects that they understand. All right. And uh, there are loads and loads of massive um, very expensive houses and, and duplex condominiums and all this that cost millions of dollars are enormous, very, very expensively built, um, um, but they're poorly designed. The architecture is, is, is ghastly. Uh, the interiors are pretty grotesque looking and, and often are more in line with what you might find at a modern hotel lobby this kind of place. And if you think about it, there was that famous house called The One that they built out in California. And it was this insanely big house and the fellow wanted several hundred million dollars for it. And I remember looking at photographs, I saw a very good photographic tour of it and it was a horrifyingly unattractive building. And it was a monstrosity and the guy couldn't sell it. Even that he couldn't sell um, uh, for a long time. I think eventually he did. But there's a lot of houses like that and, and they're just awkwardly built. There's no soul, there's no heart, there's no, there's no nothing in it that makes you say, I love this place. And um, uh, basically, uh, they just fill them with sort of vapid, uh, incredibly expensive objects at times. And that's what they go with. All right. And this, this is this is the, the dividing line between people, I think, who have uh, a, a, an interest in taste and art and music and art history um, and furniture design, um, where they separate from uh, uh, the rest of the pack, so to speak. So you, you come back to the question, well, why, why do people collect art? What, what, what's, the, what's behind it? Um, why do they want antiques and art to live with in their homes? Because they're interested in the world. They're interested in history. They're interested in what went on before. And an interesting question is, is it, what's the, what's the, where does it start? Okay. Um, and, and I think it really begins with curiosity. Uh, people who collect antiques and art are very curious people by nature. And uh, if you put a few uh, collectors in a room, even if they collect entirely different things, they will, you will quickly find them all engaged in a very interesting conversation and a, and a mutual appreciation, this sort of universal um, love of old things and how they came to be and how they got to where they are and all of it, all of it that went into it, all of the cultural things from a certain period that resulted in this object. And, and that is how collectors are born. And uh, most collectors today, many, many collectors today, uh, were, were rat packers or collectors as children. Uh, they were interested in baseball cards. They were interested in collecting coins. They would bring home uh, things from the beach that they found, um, uh, things they found in the woods that were cool looking and interesting and all this. And, and, and that, that kind of a person, boy or girl, doesn't matter, um, fascinating.
uh, with life, fascinated with things. And, and curiosity about history of place, a time period of objects and so forth, uh, ends up becoming increasingly important to people who have curios curio are curious about material culture. All right, and, and, and eventually um, they, they get to the point where they wanna know why and how things were made, where they came from, is it rare, is it a standard piece, uh, is it only found in certain parts of the world? And fully understanding all of this and why it was made is the core of all true collectors, um, no matter what it is they collect. No matter where they collect or how they began collecting, that's sort of at the core of it. And you'll 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 never get to the story of history without a curious nature. Um, you just won't. Um, uh, and then with that understanding, um, it, you you begin to say, well, how does this make me feel? Do I like it? And then do I want to live with it in my daily life? And if you view and contemplate objects in this way, you'll probably be very happy pursuing these interests as it will enrich your life, it'll enrich your family's life and uh, anybody who visits your home, uh, they'll be fascinated by it. All right, collections are, are created over, typically over very long periods of time. Um, uh, I've known some collectors that now in their, in their 90s that started collecting when they were in their 20s and they never stopped. And uh, they may at times buy and sell, you know, sell a few things to buy something else to make room for it as their tastes change a little bit. But in general, good collectors hang on to 90% of whatever it is they buy once they get a little bit of proficient at it just because they bought it for a reason and that reason remains valid for the rest of their lives. And uh, the collecting habits may ebb and flow. You may, a collector may spend a time focusing heavily on paintings or heavily focused on table objects, something like that. Um, and then they'll go on to something else, but then they'll always come back to it. So these, these interests ebb and flow. They ebb and flow, and, and, and behind them, they leave a trail of interesting stories, of, you know, a highly individual collection um, of visually and intellectually satisfying objects is always an interesting discussion for people. Uh, they, they find it fascinating, especially if they find another person who collects similar things and they can compare notes and they become almost instant friends, almost kindred spirits. It, it's, it's pretty amazing. And uh, this is very different than, than, than merely owning things, okay? Uh, merely owning things doesn't make you a collector, even if you own a great deal of things. Um, you know, if you own a, you know, if you own a few Rothkos and uh, William and Mary furniture or Fabergé eggs and all this, if you didn't acquire them because you were genuinely interested in that topic, but you were told, well, this is this is what you know people with a lot of money buy, or this is what certain people buy, and you want to be like them, so you're going to buy that too, without any real understanding about about the lives of the people that went into making them. You're just you're just a buyer. You're not a collector. You're the owner, and that's that's it. And it begins and ends there. Uh, many years ago, I was I was involved with uh, doing an appraisal, one one that really I remembered uh, for I still remember it very well, because it was a, a fantastic house outside of Boston. And it was about a 12,000 foot house in, in the town of Wellesley. And uh, the, the man that lived there was a very, very successful financial guy. Um, he had been in New York and Boston. He'd been at Goldman Sachs. He, it, he'd made a fortune. He'd become very, very wealthy. And he was now in his late 60s. And he had this enormous house. And it was full of great art and great antiques. It was unbelievable. It was really something. And as I was doing the appraisal, I realized he didn't know anything about the objects in his house. Um, because I would ask him about the, the, the he, had, he had a very good uh, high boy chest that was made in Boston by a very famous cabinet maker. Um, and it was instantly recognizable. And uh, he, uh, I said, what do you, what, what, what's the story behind that? How did you come by that? <clears throat> and he just said, I don't know. I, I, put, I keep my socks in it. He said, he said uh, my, my wife and the decorator went out and found it. And I said, is your wife an antique collector? She says, no. She said, she, but, but we have a, a decorator that thought we should have it and so forth. And they paid a huge amount of money on for it. Uh, they had paintings. They had a painting from a Gloucester painter, right, who lived where I live. And he was very famous. He didn't live here all the time. He was in and out. He's, he lived in Maine part of the time. Um, a, a very famous artist. And uh, he, he bought it for almost seven figures at the time. Okay, and uh, I said, well, you know, how did you come to own that? And he said, well, it, it, my wife liked it, and it went with the drapes, and he, he's, a, he's a New England painter, I think. And that was all he knew. That's all he knew. That's all he knew. He, and, and he didn't really have an interest in it beyond that. 
And it was sad. It was sad to see. He had great, great carpets and great silver and all this, but none of it meant anything to him. They were just objects that were sort of like a, a backdrop, a stage, a, 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 a prop for his life that offered him nothing else beyond that. And I, I, I left there saying, what an, an amazing collection and what a sad situation that is. Um, you know, in developing a tasteful home, um, uh, is it, it's really reflective of you. And this, this house wasn't reflective of him at all because he didn't know what it was he had bought or that his wife had bought. And I, I didn't get the impression his wife even knew what they really bought. But they had, they had sort of a bottomless wallet, and that's what they spent their money on. And um, lots of money helps to develop a, a good-looking house, but it's, it's not at all essential, and it's not the point. Um, the idea of acquiring art and antiques to live with um, means it's of interest to you. And that's what it always, you know, used to be um, uh, over the years. But it, it's, it seems to have gone awry in the last 30 or so years. And if you don't have an understanding or an interest in objects and their meanings and their historic origins and their evolution through time, how they evolved, how they changed, and a deep desire to enjoy them in your daily life, um, you can never really, what I have called great, what I call great personal taste, um, and so forth. That lack of knowledge and understanding and appreciation that would otherwise sculpt your life in a positive way just is just a backdrop. It's just a, it's just a, it's just a, it's like being on a stage and this is your stage and these are the things you surround yourself with because they complement you. And the idea is that you want to collect art and antiques um, so that they complement your life, um, which is a different thing. All right. And among folks who actually have tastes for and, and an appreciation, a desire to own and live with fine, authentic things, in particular, fine art and antiques and good contemporary objects, if you can find them, um, uh, that, 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 that should be the goal. That should be the, the end goal. And uh, I, I, I don't know how else to say it, really. In my own case, it's interesting. When I, when I look at a room, um, I always look at the objects individually um, because I was trained as a dealer. Um, we're used to going into, into, into auction halls and barns and seeing objects and the ability to extract that object in your mind's eye and look at it separate from its surroundings to develop an appreciation for it is, is a bit of a trained uh, skill. Um, I, I know dealers that go to lots of auctions and they have a really hard time separating the object um, away from the clutter around it mentally. They can't visualize it. Uh, and other people are, are much better at it, okay? And, and, and then you, once you're able to do that, uh, and what I do, when I go to a house, that's what I do. I look at the room, I look at the tables, the chairs. I, I sort of blank out anything that's not authentic because it doesn't mean anything, it's just a thing. And um, uh, zone in on the uh, objects that are particularly interesting, the things that are particularly beautiful, the things that are, are, have a design and an appearance based on something historic, um, uh, uh, that, that, that has that, that has an interesting side to it, and um, and 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 then I have to decide: does the item have merit or not? Do I recognize it, um, you know, as as good or interesting? Um, is it new to me? Is it something I've never seen before? Because I do, you do still see things you haven't seen before, or variants of things that you haven't seen before, and and they can strike you, and you say, "Wow, I've never seen one of those before," and then you're sort of driven on to want to know more about its historic origins and so forth. And that's how, um, uh, when, I, when I go into a house or, or, or a museum or somewhere, I look at everything. I, I sort of weigh it all out in my mind and think about it. Um, and it's the same approach I think uh, most people take when they visit a museum for the first time. And the museums uh, generally make it easy for you because they have everything separate. And you can stand and look at an object or a painting or something there, and it's, it's separated enough. There's enough space between it and the next item that you can focus on it and really absorb from it and enjoy what it is. And uh, it's a, it's a, museums are fabulous places because you, you, there's, there's, there's one, one guy once said to me, he, I said, do you ever go to museums? And he goes, why? None of the stuff is for sale. And uh, he, he will never be a good, a good dealer or collector. Um, that's all there is to it, and he never was, uh, because he didn't see it for its appreciated for its own presence, 
and that's what it really really takes it's like admiring a beautiful a beautiful house a beautifully designed house that's lasted three two or three hundred years and you look at it you don't own it but you can say wow that's a beautiful house well the same should go for objects the same should be this uh, hold true for a, a, a very finely made chest of drawers or a very finely made uh, rock crystal chandelier or gilt b uh, door bronzes from france or something whatever it is they have to stand out on their own and you have to be able to appreciate them for what they are, regardless of where they are, all right? And uh, do they leave an overall positive impression? Um, you know, uh, do, do they give you something? And if they do, you're, you, you've got the bones to be a collector. That's all there is. And, you, and, and the other thing that's interesting, you can learn an awful lot about people, about seeing how they live and where they live and what they live with. And it doesn't mean you have to be wealthy. People often say, well, I can't collect art because I'm not rich. The simple fact of the matter is, is that if you have a true interest in art and antiques um, with, a, with a, a bit of work and a bit of diligence and genuine curiosity, you can build up a, a reservoir of significant knowledge over time, over a lifetime, because it's a lifetime pursuit, and can fairly often find things that are um, uh, uh, very affordable and often very much under the money. Um, uh, what you would expect to pay maybe at a, at a fancy uh, gallery or somewhere. Some of the greatest buys I've ever made in the antique business were from antique dealers, uh, but they were selling something in an area they didn't know anything about. They may have bought it in a box lot at a, in an auction. It was in the bottom of the box. They didn't even notice until they got back to their antique shops. They might have picked it up at a house sale or something. They didn't know much about it, but it looked good, so they put it in the store for you know three or four hundred dollars and see if it sells. And they didn't know it was worth eighty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars. And that's happened. That's actually that has happened more than once. And the reason I was able to benefit from that was because I knew something he didn't know. And in the world of art and antiques, knowledge is king, absolute king above all else. That is the biggest thing. And uh, as a result, you, you, with that kind of work, you can have an interior to your home that is a reflection of you, a reflection of your interest. And you don't have to spend vast sums of money to get there. As a matter of fact, today you can buy um, very good early American furniture, early British furniture, French furniture, Italian furniture, in many cases for much less than contemporary modern stuff that will literally be worth 10 or 15 cents on the dollar the day you put it in your car and take it away from the store. And those objects uh, bought at auction, bought from, from, uh, from good local antique dealers and so forth that have some taste, um, you can generally do much, much, much better financially and preserve capital because you bought something that's probably not going to plummet in value the way a flat screen TV does or a designer couch and so forth because those things uh, drop like bricks. Um, uh, that, that case I just told you about the gentleman we did the appraisal for, um, he had in his house, I remember he had a, uh, a, a, a sofa that was upholstered by Brunschwig and Fee or one of these fancy places. It was all custom made. It was a very nice sofa. He paid $35,000 for it um, 10 years before I saw it. And this was, so he bought that in the early 90s, I guess it was, and, uh, or five years before I saw it. And, and he, he said, well, he said, if I go to sell this in a few years, what would it be worth? Like, if I got rid of this house. And I said, you, you might get three or 4,000 for it. Uh, so he, he's tied up $35,000 for a decade. Um, and it's now worth uh, 10 cents on the dollar to what he paid for it is what it amounts to. All right. And this is, this is the, the, the sad reality of uh, buying a lot of the stuff that's on the market today. It's not a good value even. And it's just, it's just stuff. It's just stuff. Now, upholstered furniture and things like that. Um, antique upholstered furniture is not especially comfortable to sit on. So if you have, like, like in our own house, we bought um, some licensed, a lot of Bauhaus design furniture because it's very comfortable. It's well designed. It's beautifully made and so forth. Uh, but other than that, furniture wise, painting wise, um, um, you can you can do much 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 better by um, getting yourself familiar with the antique and art market and the designer market and that kind of thing. Um, the, the truth is is that true true taste true style has nothing to do with money but everything to do with curiosity and a desire to live in an environment that has a distinct feel and atmosphere of genuineness and that's the that's the, the, the one of the the big things um, that you you'll see when you look at a lot of houses today uh, they're just big empty rooms uh, some houses the only thing worth looking at that has any sort of visual activity going on is the flat screen in the corner of the room 
all right? The flat screen in the den. Uh, there's no artwork on the wall. There, there's no wonderful sculptures. There's no bronze. There are no bronzes. There are no beautiful handmade carpets. It's all machine made. And, you know, when, when they're done with the house, you basically could just back up a dumpster and throw it all out uh, because very little of it will have any value at all. It, it's what keeps yard sales going, okay? And uh, and this, this, is, this is the problem. Uh, so many houses today are just filled with what I call dead objects or soulless objects. Uh, they, there's no genuineness to them. There's no there's no his, history at them. You can't look at them and say, oh well, that 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 table um, had its origins in England in the early 17th century, or um, that painting uh, came out of a certain school of art, and and you immediately recognize it, and you can go through what you what you know about it and appreciate it for the period and the time in which it was created. And you don't get any of those added benefits. Everything you see in most modern de decorator houses are just pastiches, are just things that maybe they look a little bit like one of the old objects that the, 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 the maker was trying to copy, or maybe it looks a little like some great designer thing that was done uh, by a famous guy in the 20s or the 30s. Um, and it's sort of in that manner of, but it doesn't quite make it. It doesn't quite make the mark. And uh, as I said, ultimately, all this stuff ends up in landfills, all right? Um, uh, they're, 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 the, the bulk of things that you see in houses today uh, that have dead furnishings, it's, it's just they're all sort of nondescript. Um, it's sort of like it's sort of like uh, the, the FTD flower vase the, 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 what you, that you get when someone sends you flowers. It's it's a it's a they make those in China for about fifty cents a piece. Um, from a design standpoint, it's it's a tubular shaped ceramic object that you can put water in, and that's all there is to it. It's not like a great piece of early American uh, pottery, a great piece of French porcelain, or a great piece of Chinese porcelain that has a long history um, and uh, uh, it can be. It can be researched and you can understand how they decorated it, how they made it, where the first ones were made and all that. Um, that's not uh, uh, what you get with a lot of the stuff that's being sold on the market today. So I always encourage people, I said, I said, you could go out and, and learn a bit and study a bit and, and do it th that way. Otherwise, you're just going to end up with a house full of useful junk. And uh, it won't give, add anything to your life. The idea of collecting art is to have things added to your life so that your life is better, more interesting. Um, when you travel, uh, if, you, if you're able to travel places, uh, you, you, go to, you go to museums, you go to historic houses, you go places, and you see things that are similar to something that you have, or you see something you've never seen before, and ah, oh, you're interested. And that's how it goes. Furnishings in a house should be much more than um, a place where you put your socks, a place where you sit to eat, um, and that sort of thing where you socialize it's more than just a space it should be an environment around you all right and that is that is the uh, the, 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 the that should be the goal of anybody because as you get older you're going to find yourself very tired of living with things that don't make any sense and don't have any don't have any uh, core value as far as cultural objects go living with cultural objects is a wonderful thing and um Unfortunately, today, too many people are influenced by what gets published in Architectural Digest or some other interior design magazine about what they should do, what's, you know, the, the new color schemes that they think people are going to want. And all of this is just to, is to stimulate you into going out and redoing your house. Um, and if you did it right the first time, you don't have to ever redo it again. Um, uh, great houses, uh, uh, for example, don't need their interiors painted over every five or ten years. Uh, it's an interesting thing. My, my wife and I were in uh, Italy a number of years ago, and we were staying um, at, a, at, a, at a family friend's house. It's a, a Palladian villa, um, Palazzo Barossa, in, in the Veneto. And it's a spectacular place. And um, all the walls in the house were murals, and they were all painted by a Veronese. Okay, They were painted you know, 500, four or 500 years ago. They're still there. They have not been painted over. Nobody said, oh, we've got to paint this over again. Um, and, and, and that is what you find in, in, with, in great houses. G great interiors um, do not need to be repainted every couple of years or every 10 years, unless you're going through some radical change in life and you just really hate the color that you're living with. 
but colors in general on walls and all this sort of thing um, are, are the, uh, should be the last thing you worry about in what you're living with in your own space in your home um, so that you don't end up with dead soulless objects all right and and this this is what it's all about and uh, unfortunately, with decorators and designers, they often sort of feed things to people that, that they don't really understand, they don't really want, but they feel pressure to buy it, and they do. So I would urge you, if you are interested in, in, in antiques and living in a beautiful place, you'll, you'll end up with a... Pursue that interest. All right, and I'll do some more videos on this because there's lots to talk about in this area. Because the idea of collecting antiques, and in my case, it's, it's, we, have, we have in our home, we have Chinese art, English furniture, American furniture, Italian furniture. Um, we have Persian rugs and all kinds of paintings from every culture you could possibly imagine, um, in, including African art and uh, all kinds of things. But it, the, the bottom line is it is stuff that my wife and I both enjoy, from um, uh, Murano glass to uh, uh, Chin Lung uh, uh, chargers. Um, all of them are, are play together beautifully in, in the house and they can play together beautifully in your house and they won't cost you an arm and a leg. There are lots of great things that you can buy and learn to um, uh, appreciate over time more and more and more. All right. And this is, this is the, I think, the, the great thing about developing your own taste, developing your own interest, stimulating your curiosity, and then going out and doing the work that's needed to, um, uh, to build that around your life. All right. And uh, otherwise, you're going to end up stuck in that epidemic of dead furniture and unattractive material. And um, for me, life without art and antiques surrounding me every day uh, is, is a pretty empty, would be a pretty empty environment and very depressing. Um, uh, and and uh, th that's all there is to it. All right. So the idea is that you want to understand and appreciate the objects around you and uh, go from there. All right. And I'm going to uh, uh, do a few more of these. If you like, like this kind of conversation, uh, let me know. Um, if you don't like it, let me know. Uh, but it's, it's something I think that's worthwhile because the, the bottom line is among antique and art collectors um, that want to develop their, uh, their collections and, 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 and boost their taste. Taste is learned and you want to refine your tastes. Um, uh, th this, this is uh, an area uh, that we're all pursuing because you don't buy antiques to keep them somewhere else. You don't buy art to keep them somewhere else. Um, you buy art and antiques to make them part of your home. And that's, that's what I think is, it should be the goal for everybody um, that has an interest in the subject, that have a curious nature and uh, w want to uh, go from there. All right, so thanks for watching. Have a great week, and uh, we'll be back later this week with the regular video, but I wanted to get this done and uh, say Happy New Year to everybody. All right, bye-bye.